The big questions are the questions that everybody at some point in their lives asks themselves. It does not matter whether you are atheist, agnostic, Jewish, Christian, Muslim, Hindu, Buddhist, it does not matter. Everybody at some time in their lives asks themselves, who made me and why am I here? An atheist, if asked, who made you, will answer, well, we as a creation are the result of the Big Bang, which brought the universe into existence, and we are the result of evolution, which brought life into existence and the diversity of life as we know it. That is the atheist answer. But does that answer make sense? I would submit that it does not, and here is the evidence. To begin with, let's look at the Big Bang. First of all, let's understand that the Islamic religion does not have any problem with the Big Bang. Islamic religion does not deny that the Big Bang happened. The Islamic religion, however, teaches that the Big Bang was under the control of the Creator. To begin with, the Big Bang did not start with the explosion. The Big Bang started long before. Before the explosion, there was a primordial dust cloud, a dust cloud in the nothingness of space, which drew together as a massive hyperdense core of mass and energy, and it was that that exploded. So where did this dust cloud come from for this explosion? If there is one thing we know from science, it is that we do not get something from nothing. In the explosion, it was the greatest explosion in the history of our universe. It blew everything outward to the universe as we have it today, which is expanding as we know it. And yet we are to believe that this supposedly random event resulted in the perfection of the universe as we know it, whereas any other explosion results in destruction and chaos. This is an example where science contradicts science. In science, there is a general principle called entropy. Entropy is the principle that unless there is a greater control over a process, the process tends to chaos. Now let's put it into real world terms. It does not matter whether you are talking about your child's bedroom, the kitchen sink, your workplace, or a complex chemical reaction. If it is not under control, it generates into chaos. If your child does not clean up his room, if somebody does not control the dishes in the sink, if somebody does not control the chemical reaction, the result is going to be random and chaos. But we are to believe that the massive explosion of the Big Bang resulted in perfection and not chaos. This is an example where science contradicts science. If you look at a painting, you know that there was a painter. If you look at a sculpture, you know that there was a sculptor. If you look at a building, you know that there was an architect and a construction company. And yet we are to look at creation and think that there is not a creator. The proposal of the atheist is that we evolved by natural selection with the absence of a creator. But I have a question for those who put forward this theory. But how can you explain where the soul came from? If you believe in the existence of a human soul, how can you explain this as having evolved? For that matter, how can you explain life as having evolved? And what do I mean by life? I mean the power that gives a body once assembled to live. 
We have reached a point in science where we can transplant virtually every organ of the body, but not all of the world's scientists over the history of mankind, if you brought them all together, cannot make them live. And we cannot give a body life. That is why, once dead, medicine is not able to revive a dead person, even when their organs are still functioning. And the proposal is that everything in our existence, if we don't have some control over it to keep it in order, everything degenerates into chaos, except for the Big Bang and except for evolution. Those two things, just by themselves, they tended toward perfection. Well, there are some people who accept that explanation, but I submit to you that it is not of those who are enlightened, it is not of those who have open minds or open hearts who accept that explanation. Why are we here? If we agree that as we are creation, there is a creator, we have to ask the question, why? For what purpose were we created? I ask everybody to look around, not just now, but for the rest of the night. Everything that you see that we have ever made with the hands of man, we have made for a purpose. Does it not make sense then that our creator made us to serve him? In fact, this is what Allah tells us in the Holy Quran. And I, God, have not created jinn and men except that they should serve, and some translate worship, me meaning Almighty God Allah. So that is the purpose of our creation. That is reason for our existence. So how? How do we serve Him? Our Creator gave everything a guidance system. We have light to find our way during the day. We have the stars and the moon to find our way at night. This is for seeing animals. Birds migrate by polarized light. That is how they are able to migrate even when there are clouds covering the sky. They can read the polarization of the light even though they cannot see the sun. Other animals migrate by reading the magnetic field of the earth. Whales, lobsters can actually sense the magnetism of the earth and follow it, and that is how they find their way. That was the gift of our Creator to them. Salmon, this delicious fish that we have, leave the place of their birth, go down the river, out into the ocean for years. They smell their way from the vastness of the ocean to the river they were born with, back to the exact spot they were born. Bats and river dolphins have sonar. Marine animals in the deep ocean, so deep that there is no light, they can read electrical currents. Insects have pheromones, which are chemicals so sensitive that they can sense a single molecule and find their ways to food, find their ways to a mate. My point is that our Creator has given everything in his creation guidance by which it can find its way to the things that it needs, food, a mate, etc. Can we possibly believe for one minute that our Creator would have so much mercy that he would give us guidance in all things, give guidance to all of his creation in all things, but he would not give us guidance to the hereafter? Is it possible to believe that? What would be the guidance to the hereafter? Obviously, revelation. We buy a television, we buy a car, we buy a computer. What does it come with? An instruction manual. The instruction manual, by the way, is written by who? By the one who made the product. That is the one who knows it best. So it only makes sense that the instruction manual for us would be written by the one who made us, the one who knows us best. Think of any instruction manual you ever read. 
It starts with what? Warnings. What will happen if you use this product incorrectly? Then it tells you how to use it correctly and the benefit that you will gain by doing so. And it finishes with what? A troubleshooting guide. How is that different from Revelation? Revelation tells us what not to do and the consequences of that. It tells us what to do and the benefit to be gained thereby. And it gives us a troubleshooting guide. In other words, it tells us how to sort ourselves out if we have a problem, how to correct our deficiencies and guide ourselves aright. Now, if you meet the specifications of what your duties are, you will reap the reward. And if you are an employee who is substandard, what happens to you? You get fired. Think about that word. Fired. The consequence of underperforming. The consequence of not meeting standards. That word did not come from nowhere. In the same way that a person who is a failure in life finds the fire in the hereafter, the employee who is a failure on his job gets fired. So let us not be failures in life and let us not be failures in the hereafter. Why? What is the need for revelation? Isn't it enough for all of us just to be good? I'm a good person, that's enough. So isn't that enough? The answer is no, it's not enough. Why? Well, to begin with, we have to examine the reason for revelation. Our Creator is fair and just. Our Creator is fair and just. When we die, we are going to the day of judgment where we are going to be evaluated and assigned either to punishment or to paradise. To establish justice, you need four things. You need a judge, you need a court, you need witnesses, and you need a book of laws. If you do not have any of those four things, how can you establish justice? And on the day of judgment, the judge will be Allah, the book of laws will be the Holy Quran, and the witnesses will be the elements of creation, and the court will be the day of judgment. It is by those four things that we will be measured. The angels who are in attendance with us from the day we are born until the day we die will bear witness. Our own hands will bear witness to what they have wrought. Our own tongues will say what has passed through it. We will bear witnesses against ourselves. The angels will bear witnesses as well. Other elements of creation who have witnessed our deeds will be there as well. And there will be no deed, large or small, that will be missed. Those will be our witnesses in the courtroom of the Day of Judgment. And we will be measured by what? By a book of laws. And we will be judged by who? By Allah. Now, if Allah did not have that book of laws, would he be establishing justice? If we were assigned a place in, in the hereafter without having a chance, to guide ourselves aright in this life, then that would be injustice. Back to the question, isn't it enough just to be good? What is good? What is good? Good is defined by our Creator, not by us. Go and gather a hundred different people together and ask them what is good to you and you will get many different answers. Obviously, there are criminals out there. There are criminals out there who enjoy being criminals. They enjoy certain crimes. And for them, that is good. There are tyrannical leaders throughout history who have led their entire populations to destruction. Men like Pharaoh, military leaders, 
who have led their people and their armies and their countries to destruction on the basis of misguidance because they set the rules for themselves instead of accepting the guidance of our Creator. Mankind cannot agree on social justice, economics, politics, laws. We cannot agree. So what is good if not what is defined by our Creator? It is interesting that it is in the field of religion that mankind presumes to write its own rules, to do what we feel we want to do. We are following nothing but our own desires. And that is not the example of the righteous, that is not the example of the pious throughout time. Why can't we worship God in our own way? Another big question that comes up. I'll tell you why. I'm in India. I came from Saudi Arabia. I was born and raised in America. But you know what? There are places here where if I go and I eat a meal, they will not take my Saudi reals and they will not take my American dollars. Do you get the point? You have to pay with the currency that is accepted. Once again, you can't make your own rules. You have to pay with the currency that is accepted. If you are not paying with the currency that is accepted, you will be in default. Think about any laws that you have ever been subjected to, city, state, international. They have all been written by men. They have all been designed as guides. But over them all are the laws of God Almighty Allah. That is the guidebook for our lives and that is what leads to paradise in the hereafter. Inshallah we have agreed that as we are creation there is a creator over all things. Inshallah we have agreed that the purpose in our life is to serve and worship him. And inshallah we have agreed that the way in which we serve and worship him is to follow the book of his guidance, Revelation. What I am now going to take a minute to discuss is why we should consider Islam as the completion of that revelation. I'm going to start with what I know best, which is the monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. The Old Testament predicted three prophets to follow. John the Baptist was one, Jesus Christ was the second, leaving three minus two equals one. Now, we would expect that it makes sense that Jesus Christ, if there were a prophet to follow him, would have mentioned the fact, maybe not directly, but in some way. This takes us to John chapter 14, verses 16 through 17. In these verses, Jesus Christ speaks of his going away. He says, and I will pray the Father, and he will give you another helper, that he may abide with you forever, even the Spirit of Truth. Let's not read it in the translation. Let's read it in the manuscript from which it is translated. Notice I am being very careful with my words. I am not saying let's read it in the original. There is no original. Make no mistake about it. The, everybody who has ever done translation knows that when you make a translation, something gets lost in translation. But, as I said, it's the best we have. And what the passage says in Greek is allos parakletos. Allos meaning another, parakletos meaning paraclete. Now, paraclete has been fought over. It has been argued about. What does paraclete mean? It has been translated helper, advocate, assistant, Holy Spirit, comforter. I'll tell you right now. In the phrase, allos paracletos, it doesn't matter what paraclesos means. The word that is important is allos, another. Why? Because in the first epistle of John, 
chapter 2, verse 1. Jesus Christ is identified as a paraclete. Read it in the Greek. Don't read it in your translation. It states that we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. The word translated to advocate is paraclete. Now, what is the conclusion? The first epistle of John 2.1 tells us Jesus Christ was a paraclete. Then Jesus Christ tells us that at the end of his mission, following his mission, another paraclete, Allos Paracletos, will come. What is the obvious conclusion? Whatever Jesus Christ was, a prophet, he is telling of another to come, another prophet. Does it not make sense that when we are told in the Old Testament of three prophets to follow, when we find two of those prophets in the New Testament and the last of them speaking of the final prophet to come, does it not make sense to follow the chain of revelation to its conclusion, to embrace the final prophet predicted by the previous books of scripture, to acknowledge Muhammad, peace be upon him, as that prophet. I would mention, again, if you look in the New Testament, you only find this word, paraclete, mentioned five times. In these five times, it is mentioned that the one who will come will honor Jesus Christ, and he will be the spirit of truth. It's interesting to note that in the life of Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, even his enemies knew him by the title of Asadiq al-Amin, the truthful, the honest. And Islam is the only religion, it's the only major world religion that honors Jesus Christ as he deserves to be honored as a prophet of Allah. Please, not for me, for yourselves, for your families, for the lineage that is going to follow in your wake, for your children, your grandchildren, and all who will follow until the day of judgment. Accept what is clear in front of your eyes. The Holy Quran is revelation from Almighty God, Allah. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was his final prophet. And if you have any doubt about this message, pray to God for guidance, pray to our Creator. Just use that term. Pray to our Creator with sincerity, asking Him to guide you to the religion of truth.